recording in all right so we're recording now so today we're gonna do a double dose you get a double dip today of uh 18 and 19 and then you're gonna have to hold intention uh 19 because we only do the first part of ezra um, the books Ezra and Nehemiah were probably one book. We've separated them into two, but it was probably two scrolls. Within Ezra and Nehemiah, there are three distinct sections uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and um, Nehemiah. Uh, Zerubbabel obviously wasn't good enough, they didn't get their own book, uh, but Ezra and Nehemiah get quoted in the scroll. So, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start out in Daniel and we'll walk through a bit of Daniel. Daniel is a unique book. Uh, if you like the book of Revelation, read the prequel, Daniel, um, and, um, and it will help illuminate your understanding of um, the book of Revelation. Um, and, and structured in an interesting way. Then we'll move into Ezra, uh, the first part of Ezra. It's about Ezra one through like six or seven is Zerubbabel's portion of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so that's what they put into chapter 19. There's some really great pieces of the text ultimately in the exile. Now the question is where are we at in the midst of the exile, right? So we have the northern kingdom has been conquered by Assyria and they've been taken away. The southern kingdom was conquered by Babylon and they, most of them have been taken away. Um, and that's kind of in that same space that they, they put Daniel. Hard to actually know when Daniel is, um, but it's, it's in the midst of the exile. We know that. Um, and uh, so they think that this is the first deportation because Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, or Rakshak and Benny, as we uh, know from Veggie Tales, um, Rakshak and Benny are elevated to really high levels. So they probably were very intelligent or they were, they were good at what they do. So they were brought up to such a high level. So that's why we're in the hunch of first uh, first wave of the exile. Does that make sense? I'm going too fast. This is my first cup of coffee, so <laughs> I'm not going for coffee. I just, we have a lot to go, a long way to go and a short time to get there. Uh, so I want to move us, uh, us through this as fast as we can. All right, so. 18 and 19, instead of doing small groups today, again, because we have two chapters to cover. And if we have time at the end, you can small group all you want to. I'll leave. Um, but uh, uh, any questions that come that came out of 18, let's just start there right off the bat. I think it's recording. Yep, yes. it is. Yep. Thanks. It's a good question to ask, actually. I know one. Yeah. Um, Daniel is a real person. Ah, good question. So is Daniel much like the book of Jonah? Is it uh, a message that was set up to be uh, organized as a sort of warning, but also hope, right? Because ultimately that's where the message of Daniel will get us to, right? Um, I, scholars have gone back and forth and back and forth on that. I think that the story of Daniel probably uh, exists in some sort of a mixture. The weird part about the structure of the book of Daniel is that the first chapter is in Hebrew. Then two, three, four, five, six, seven, they're all in. Aramaic, and then it goes back into Hebrew. Now, why would they do that, right? The, so the middle section in Aramaic, that would have been the language that was spoken by the Babylonian Empire. And that was why that was brought in. People talk about Jesus spoke Aramaic. And that's a holdover from like when, as we know now, the Persians will beat them and send them back. But they 
held them over. And so they sent them back, right? Um, there isn't anything that we can clearly identify other than the story itself gets it right. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Balthazar, though between the two of them, like Nebuchadnezzar is again the older king, and he uh, is the one that turns into the wild beast and eats like grass, but then repents and becomes a person. And Balthazar's son does not and gets conquered. He's the one that um, like gets killed that night after the hand. He doesn't see the writing on the wall. <laughs> get that? You get that? You read? It's a joke. Um, so why why do scholars think that Daniel's not a real person? Because the stories are more figurative. They they illuminate things that are so. Would somebody actually be able to go to a lion's den or into a fiery furnace? Even the story of the fiery furnace. Like so the, then are the other three not real also that went into the fire? Shadrach, Meshach, yeah. and Abednego. So the, the idea is, is this just like a story that has been spun to offer hope to the people, right? Yeah. Or is it a historical narrative of the actual events that happened, right? So the king ordering the fire to be turned up seven times, right? That's like ridiculous. The, the concept around that is like, at some point in time, you can't go seven times higher. Like, uh, and maybe it's an emphasis to say, oh, we just want it to be really, really hot, right? The fourth image of the person that's in the fire, right? Um, all of that, like that, uh, they but that would be the close to right? Well, this, so it's not defined. A lot of people want to put God there, right? Want a lot of people want to put Jesus there, maybe even. Uh, want some people want to put like a, an angel there, um, as a, a protector, and all of those things could have happened. Again, that's the other side of the story. <coughs> the other side is to say that these are stories; these are miracle stories. Things that we cannot explain that even when all of this happened, um, that God still protects God's people, right? And so it's it's the other coin of the of the way that Daniel could be read. But you could you could say that about the fact of the old testament. I was just yeah. I'm just gonna say that you, did, was yeah. Moses real? Was that yeah. just a you know a you know what you call it? Well there so so this leads into a longer story and we can get into it. Um, so it's the way, so the Tower of Babel is an interesting one, right? Because it's actually a word play on Babylon. And so it, and when those things were written down, according to our earliest accounts is after or during uh, times in which they occurred, right? They're, they're stories that are transmitted back. So it's not a culture that wrote things down, right? at least from what we have. Now, here's the funny thing. We had all this stuff. And then there was this thing that came across called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And turns out we had the same words that were in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, for the books that we were using in the scriptures, even the whole of the prophet Isaiah is, is the only full scroll that exists in there. We, we had the same thing, right? It managed to survive all of these years in this like hut in the middle of the Dead Sea Valley, right? If you go to the Israel Dead Sea, you take a left, you go to the Dead Sea, you take a right, and there's the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? That's why they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but they were in this like cave, and this boy was trying to sell them for leather. No, it's a great story, actually. And somebody recognized that the jottings on there were not. They were not just around, and, you know, dated them and everything like that. So that's a, that's a completely different story. Could the scriptures use something uh, along the lines of Jonah? The concept of whether Jonah was real or not, it, the, more scholars are saying that Jonah was uh, a book that was written as a sort of, uh, not a comic book. Like folklore? 
Mm, kind of like folklore. I, it's kind of like, how do you tell something? It's a teaching book, but how do you tell it in an exaggerated way? So like one, I've used this term before, like political cartoons. You know how they're exaggerated? They tell the truth oftentimes, right? They're, they're naming something that is real, right? You know, so it's like, I don't have any classified documents. And then there's like papers sticking out the back of their thing. And it's, they all say classified on them or their handwritten notes of, of classified information, right? Um, that's That would be a political cartoon of right now, right? And it would be all these people lined up, right? All the past presidents and vice presidents from that are alive, right? Um, they We keep going down the line. Um, that would be a political cartoon. Jonah is so far out there in terms of how it goes, right? He, he goes the opposite way. He ends up at a belly of fish. He gets spit up on the shores. He says this like one line sermon, repent or the God will turn. And this whole city of Nineveh, which is documented to be like huge, like think, think walking through New York City using this one line sermon. Like anybody's going to care about you, Jonah. Uh, who says this, right? And the whole city, even the animals, repent. You know, so it's like, well, as you read through it, right, you're kind of like, oh yeah, I can, I can kind of see how this was used as a narrative. Now, Daniel has more to it than just that. That's why it's not as crystal clear. More scholars than not will probably say that Jonah was a book that was written, an informative story or something that was used in that front, right? There was never a guy named Jonah who got swallowed up by a whale. Jonah gets named in other places in the scriptures. That's why it probably murkies the water around Jonah. But, so like, what are they reading? Are they retelling the story of Jonah? Like, they, they, they heard this story or did they write it down? Maybe it doesn't matter as long as we know that's how much God loved us. Typically, that's exactly where scholars want to fall on all of these things, right? It's not about who wrote them or how they're written down. It's about what is written and what it says about God, right? Because ultimately the goal here in the scriptures is to help us be in relationship with God. Whether or not Daniel was in a fiery furnace or not, that's not really the purpose of the story. Ultimately, the purpose of the story is to help us remember that uh, in tough times, like this one, they were in a uh, situation where they had to make a, make a decision. And the whole book of Daniel kind of, uh, and, uh, and later Haggai, well, we covered that too. I don't know if you know this, but you read a few books of the Bible this week. Um, and Haggai, that decisions make a difference. Like what you do and how you do it matter. Which for us as Lutherans is not really what we want to talk about because that that's more like the law and uh, doing everything right. That's that's following more Catholic and Baptist theology. There, we as Lutherans want to say, well, you're forgiven even if you've done bad things. I'm like we'll just move on, right? Except for the scriptures, like they trouble that for us, and that we probably become over grace emphasized, which is fine. Luther always talked about a balance if you don't know the law if you're never convicted it's hard to feel the grace then in love of god right so if you don't know that your the decisions of what you do makes a difference if not to god then to other people how you decide to live morally in this world makes a difference to other people uh and it does uh then you haven't really understood kind of that that sense of both and if that conviction of the law is just driving you to despair or depression or all sorts of other reasons, then you need to hear the word good news, that God still cares and loves for you and has driven you, risen, pulled you back up, right? And, and it's not those things that are tied against you. It's a little both that. So Daniel, Haggai, Ezra, all about the law here. We're dealing in your actions have consequences. Those consequences are either good or bad. And uh, most of the time, you're bad. So you should try to be better. I mean, ultimately, is where we're going on. It's a long and short way of getting around that. But yeah, I think it's a good thing to wrestle with when you're in this. The story of the fiery furnace, Daniel and the lion's den, 
uh, many, many Tekel and Parson, uh, the hand, hand on the wall. All of that is written in the Aramaic section of Daniel, right? But the stories that come out at the end are really fascinating. The last couple of chapters of Daniel, which we didn't cover in the story, but if you want to read them in the Bible, you can. Uh, they illuminate a whole new way of seeing this hope of how is God at work. Um, and um, they, they continue to talk about things that are bigger than life, that come in and disrupt life. And yet there is a force that defeats them. And that's like the theme of the end of Daniel. That's all these messages of hope. Then. Uh, in the midst of exile, you feel like there is no hope. And here, uh, God will continue to give us hope. So let's, um, let's move through this unless there's questions online. One more thing about Daniel. Yes. At the very end of yes. uh, the lion, the lion's den, uh, he comes out, and then the king says, "Okay, now the person who accused you, all these people, will throw them in, plus their wives and their children." Yeah. <laughs> How is that fair? <laughs> that isn't fair. Right? <laughs> it's serious and believe God. It's, yeah. There's okay. a sense. Well, for that one, that's a sense of how exactly near he's organizations would have run right not to say that god was extremely different right he there are people ways in which god has been active in killing right um, right and i just thought oh this is so good until you get to that part then they show the women and children in their dreams you know? yeah. well we love the daniel and the lion's den story because it's one of the like only stories out of the old testament we get you know anytime there's an animal involved they're like the early publishers of Sunday school literature were like, we can do these ones. We'll make a fuzzy lion, big teeth. And you know, yeah, you could just see how it goes, right? And, uh, I love not the last part. Right? <laughs> they didn't throw people in, yeah. And actually, even in the revised common lectionary, the thing like if you remember back to Elisha, uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they leave off the section where he kills all the prophets of Baal in the revised common lecture, right? Painting a different, <laughs> they forgot that number in the paint by numbers of uh, thing. So. Well, if it's new to you though, or even for us, it's all upsetting. Yeah. 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 Right. But it's only, it's kind of upsetting because we have created a culture that only knows parts of the scripture. You know, as we'll, see in Ezra, when we get to Ezra and Nehemiah, one of the whole points of the prophet Haggai, which I'm guessing this was your first time venturing into the prophet Haggai, unless you've done the read the Bible in a year thing. And even at that, you probably just read through Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, hallelujah, New Testament. Here we are, right? You were on a mission to get to uh, the genealogy of Jesus. Um, but uh, when you got to Haggai, I mean, that's, that's Haggai's whole thing. And the earlier settlers, they, met, they, they understood Haggai really well. When people were coming into the land, they started to build their own house. And they didn't focus in on building the temple or building the church in town. Right? And so Haggai, he's a four-month preacher, has four sermons essentially and he comes in and he goes hey what are you guys doing you need to be stop building your houses stop worrying about your life and build the the temple of the lord right and uh, then the people do and then he has this really interesting line about unclean and clean right so if you are clean and you touch unclean uh something unclean this is going back to leviticus and not covered in the story, but something that we should know more. That's something, and then you go and do uh, touch some food. It does it turn the food unclean? Well, the people there are like, yeah. It, once once you turn unclean, you have to do the purity ritual, and then you can be clean again, right? That's part of the rules. Well, 
what he's emphasizing is your uncleanness is creating and, and doing uh, as you're trying to rebuild this temple because you're focused on yourself is then creating whatever you're building, whatever you're doing is unclean. It's not good for God, right? Hey guys, a good reminder uh, to us that actions have consequences in the ways that we deal or try to work through things meat makes a difference. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that was what um, I got out of today, mm. to, um, page 266. Hey, guys, uh, now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not worn. You earn wages only to put them in the purse with holes in it. Um, <coughs> that's a combination of today and the commercialism. Uh, right? Yeah, I have that's that. Why, I have that's that why same. We read the Old Testament to, I have, to apply it today well, as possible. I think, again, it's that that uh, I one of my professors, Steve Paulson, we would meet. <laughs> In, in seminary, you get sorted out into these small groups, uh, and they're supposed to be groups that help support you. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Except for my professor who was leading mine. He'd come in late, always hurriedly, he'd slam his books on the table, and he always had like 15 of them. And then he would sit down and say, all right, let us now discern the difference between the law and the gospel. Who's reading first? And then he would just point to somebody and you were to start reading. Like there was no like, how's, how's how are you doing today? Like, how's this week been? Have you, are you guys figuring things out? Is there anything that we need to talk? Anybody have something happen in their life? Like, no, we didn't have that. Um, and so it's exactly that spot. It may also be good news. It may not necessarily be the law because it may free you from something you are trying to do that isn't giving you life, but exactly. you keep trying to pursue it. And by hearing this word, it's not necessarily condemning you. It's actually could be freeing you. The people came and started working on the temple. Right. Well, and, and part of that, too, is uh, that back and forthness uh, that uh, Haggai does have. Uh, without God's presence, a blessing, whatever you have will never be enough. Ever. You can pursue more of everything, but it will never actually get there. The goalposts will consistently move without God. And that's the same thing uh, that we find in the law. You're never going to have enough money ever. You're never going to have enough time. You're never going to have enough success, enough recognition, enough anything. It's, it's, their cup is never going to be filled. Look at Tom Brady, who continues to come back to the NFL. He has seven Super Bowls, and he's done now. We'll see how well his TV career goes. But, I mean, he came back this year. Wrong decision. Clearly, Drew Brees. Played for probably three or four seasons too long, right? Why? Always in search for something more, 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 more. And well, for Tom Brady, his wife left him. Is that more? Now you can say, well, that may not be the whole story, but what do you do when you're in the pursuit of something and your eyes are so blind that you cannot see the rest of it? It's a warning. This is a warning to us um as we pursue this sort of thing that yeah. said i have a question yeah why has the jewish faith not accepted these books no they this is part of the it is hebrew part. scriptures yeah okay mm -hmm. well, yeah. there's a lot of messages that they Lost. No, what they say is that all these messages are are actually pointing to a Messiah that is not Christ, right? Uh, and clearly, we have not read our Old Testament well enough. Uh, and depending on how zealous you get on terms of either side of the coin, for 
Christians, evangelical Christians, typically will look only at all of these messages and then try to translate them into Jesus. Even our ordering of our Old Testament does that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and what they'll, they'll what people in the church race will say, no, it's close, but not quite, you know. Yeah. Things will be radically different. Everything will be different. And I think even Haggai points to that, like that while the temple is different, the second temple is different than the first temple. It's not really that temple that we're focused on. It's the new temple of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that will come down from God that will be so radically different, right? And of course, Jesus and the temple are you know, one and the same, right? That's how we understand the sacrifices, the way that we, uh, where God meets man in the Old Testament is the temple. Where God meets man in the New Testament is Jesus. And so we function in that same sort of way. So the temple has just as much importance in the Old Testament as uh, Jesus would uh, in the later parts of the Old Testament, obviously. What else came up? Anything in particular? Anything online? Anybody want to add a piece of the story or something that they saw? I particularly like the uh, on page 268. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of bright old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, <laughs> each of them with cane in hand because of their age. And the city streets will be filled with boys and girls. <laughs> What is that saying? What is that saying to you? It's a new world. Uh -huh. yeah. Hope. Hope. Yeah. A future. Yeah. yeah. When boys and girls, when you live in a neighborhood long enough, you'll see the neighborhood grow up and go away and return and grow up and go away, right? My parents have lived in the same neighborhood now for 30, maybe even 40, 30 some years now. And that neighborhood is on its second, at least, maybe even third cycle of young families moving in, and they go away. That happened to us when we moved to Delaware. Uh, we moved up by viewers, you don't know what viewers is, but it was the grocery store. <laughs> anyway, um, we moved into a young neighborhood mm. purposely. Mm. And our son came out before we were finished. We were down doing something for Chiquita. And uh, it was summer. The windows were open. And the kids were outside playing. And my son looked at me and he said, I wish you could chose the right house. I said, what do you mean? He said, there's kids here. I said, yeah. <laughs> and we became the neighborhood grandparents. Mm -hmm. And we were the that coterie of people I have now moved at the core is still there, surprisingly, but they're still close to each other, that second generation of that uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's cool. It is. It's the a... third one is coming in, but they're not as cool as we <laughs> <laughs> Two bottles of an experiment or a, a favorite. Bottle of person, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you didn't have to drive home. And if you drank too much wine, somebody would accompany you. At a bottle of person, I think that that's going to happen. Hey, I'm just guessing here. Uh, you're like, and the kids are all. All right, uh, so we've gotten to all the questions and thoughts. Let's just kind of then cycle through us, move through, and um, if anything pops up, just. Well, I, I like uh, the last yeah. two lines of the, the prose there on uh, page 261. 261. I don't think that, uh, 261. 
Sinai. I don't think it reflects the rest of the Old Testament. It says, I will discipline you, but only in due measure, which we've all complained about that, not due measure, and I will not let you go entirely unpunished. Um, I just don't know why I can tell you the story. Jeremiah. Uh, but that's the, at the very bottom of the page, because I thought Cyrus was the one who put Daniel in the lion's den. There, isn't that Darius? And at one place, it kind of implied they could be the same. I, uh, I thought about that. Cyrus and Darius. I got a little, I thought that it's one of those, you know, timeline problems that the Bible has. Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so uh, again, in Daniel, one of the issues is that they move between Hebrew and Aramaic. So uh, if you're reading it in the scriptures, right, they have different names. They, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's their Babylonian name. Uh, I can't remember what the Hebrew name is. And actually, uh, immigrants still to the day, they'll have, uh, they'll come in and they'll say, you know, uh, my name is John. And their name isn't John. You know, they've just said that because it's a lot easier than trying to describe kind of what their name is. And people keep mispronouncing it. And in the United States, we're really bad about working hard to honor people's real names. So. Yeah, it's on page 257. He became the top administrator under Darius, likely either the Persian throne name of King Cyrus. Yeah. Anyway, I did like the one part. There's just two, don't listen to the rest of it. So, <laughs> when you're in on 261, that's Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah is there. Um, so that's not Daniel. So 260, it breaks out. Then Jeremiah it would say, this is the word of the Lord, the God of Israel says, right in the book, all the words I've spoken to you. That's Jeremiah, right? So we switch out of that. And you know, so one of the things here is that Initially, uh, through Jeremiah, we know that they were being in exile for 70 years, right? And it's unclear because it gets muddied whether or not it was 70 years or seven times 70 years, 490 years. It's just a long time. So two accounts, yeah. But here is what he says. Uh, when 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise. And bring you back to this place. For I have plans for you, declares the Lord. Plans for prosper and not harm. Plans for, uh, to give you hope and a future. That's that whole sailboat thing that you see uh, there. So when you give that out to your college, you're saying, you're going off to exile. <laughs> but God will see you through this troubled time of college. And will bring you home again. Uh, right? Uh, not exactly where we want to go uh, with that because the idea is that college launches them off it. We don't need them to come back home. We want them to go out into the world, right? Um, so just be aware of what you put Bible verses on when you uh, give things away. Yet, uh, this, is the, this is a message of hope, right? This is the message that Jeremiah gives. Like, I have plans for you. And the plans are not for you to just be in exile forever, right? And much like how we say to our plans are not for you to be in college forever. Uh, we want you to move forward. Yeah. Um, we have a hope and a future, right? We have these concepts of the way that uh, once you're in through this period of time, there is going to be a future. There will be something that changes about who you are. And so in this section, right, we're in Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah's prophet that is in, in country, not out of country, like Ezekiel, or wherever we place Daniel. Um, 
And so Cyrus does give them freedom, right? It's the Persians that beat the Babylonians that then gives them the freedom that they're looking for, right? And so, yeah. But what about the other kingdom? And the first year, Babylon gets beaten by no, no, no. Beat the, by uh, no the Assyrians beat by Babylonians. So we reunited them. Uh... So that's the interesting thing. So we don't have that here in the story, but if you read through the by uh, the last section of Daniel talks about this king from the north that will come and destroy all this. They, they use these horn imagery as all throughout Daniel. There's a lot of horns. Same in the, uh, that's why Revelation, you know, you could see the writer of Revelation actually adapts a lot of things from Daniel and puts it in uh, dreams and horns and all this other jazz. Um, and the, the concept around that gets muddy because you could say like the northern kingdom, there's a there's a king that then comes in and defeats part of Persia and Syria, kind of in like 150 BC. And then there's another king that comes in uh, called Alexander the Great. You probably are more familiar with that one. And he destroys a bunch of stuff um, and takes over part of the empire uh, for the Greeks. And then there's the Roman Empire that will eventually come in. And that could be the king of the north because that's the direction that the Roman Empire moved from. They weren't coming up from Egypt. Um, at that point in time, the triumvirate was still coming down, right? Um, and we have a lot of information about Rome. They're very good at keeping records. Um, and Egypt did too, but only, Egypt only kept the records of the things that they did well. They didn't keep records of things they didn't do well. So when they lost or things happened, they didn't keep those records. They didn't want that history. But Egypt has a lot of records as well. Um, and so it could be that sort of kind of understanding of different kings coming in to do the defeats or destruction. But no matter who the king is, ultimately that king gets dethroned and God supersedes all the things and the in, the end message of the book of daniel is the same message that we kind of get that no matter what happens in our lives no matter whether we're in exile no matter whether um, we feel like lost or we feel like god is distant no matter what happens god always has the last word right and that evil will not have the last word no matter how bad things get Evil will never have the last word. And that's ultimately, even in the book of Revelation, that's the, the concept around that. Is that no matter how bad things get, all the monsters that are coming out of the sea, all that junk, like doesn't matter. The skies are turning red, doesn't matter. All that sort of stuff, the earth is quaking, it doesn't matter. Because if we believe in God and we have faith, God has the final word and will conquer all of that. That's not only a message in Revelation, that's a message in Daniel and a message then to the people who are in exile. And so imagine your whole world being tipped upside down and that ultimately God will have the last word um, in this. Let's kind of piecemeal this together, but uh, let's, let's cover some of the in the last 15 minutes, let's just cover some of the big stories so that you're kind of more aware when we get to these uh, times in uh, scripture. So there are several stories that we know. One of them from Daniel is the one where Daniel needs to pray, right, with his friends. We also know that <clears throat> the one around food, has anybody done the Daniel diet? Uh, All veggies. All veggies, yeah. All veggies for like, is it three weeks? Have you done it? I remember. No. So, mostly, but. Uh, yeah, it's a Daniel. Uh, it's an intentional. Uh, he doesn't eat the food, so he eats the food uh, of just bread? vegetables. I'm no. Uh, I wish I would have. I, I didn't prep. I didn't prep it. Uh, but you can look it up. There's a there's a thing called the Daniel diet. 
and you're not allowed to eat any food or drink anything. Yeah, for 10 days. So it's at the end of uh, chapter one, I'll read to you. 11, Daniel asked the guard of the palace, master who had a point over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are their Hebrew names. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Where is that? Uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 12. Oh, is it in here? Yeah, it's in there. This is, I get, I get confused whether or not, yeah, yeah, 250. So I get confused whether or not things get included or not. Um, and I tend to prep by reading the actual. Yeah, it says, at the end of the 10 days, they look healthier and better nourished, mm -hmm. and then they wait the royal. So they talk about this in the, in the black church in particular. This is a thing. They do the Daniel fast, oftentimes as a communal Daniel fast. They will uh, pick certain times of the year or times that match uh, what's going on, and they will do the Daniel fast together which means only vegetables. And when we mean only vegetables, we mean only vegetables. No fruit, no bread, no cookies, no peanut butter, <laughs> no cookies, and only water. No soda water, oh, no, no coffee. coffee. Oh, wow. It's a complete 10-day no cleanse. And I tell you what, when people do it, they are grouchy. <laughs> but there's something about doing it together as a whole. That like you're you're moving through this together as a as a group, and you're only gonna eat vegetables. And uh, so the one thing that does get classified, they do when the Daniel fast, they have oatmeal for breakfast. That's one thing. And they also, much like um, Muslims, they don't include, kids can have whatever they need to have, right? So it's too hard. You try to clean up their nutrition, but they can still eat meat and things along that nature. Your concept is around 10 days of doing it. And, you can do it for Lent. And this is shorter than Lent. It's only 10 days, right? Uh, you, you, and uh, you could try it. Uh, supposedly, it's a very interesting endeavor. I myself have never been able to do it 10 days of just eating vegetables. I don't know what would happen to my body if I did that. Uh, and then they, then you return to a regular meal. In fact, usually it ends with a feast. There's a sense of like coming together and your body uh, feels different and you act different. Even in the season of Lent, thinking through fasting, right? how that can change the way that you interact and act uh, with, with anything. So when they, when they went to all the vegetables, they had been eating off of the king's table. And you can imagine what the king's table was. It was probably all fat and um, um, carbohydrates, and they didn't feel good. So when they went to the vegetables, they felt better because yeah. the body was being cleansed and getting rid of all of that uh, fat in their body. Yeah. So yep. my mother always used to say moderation in all things. And I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. All right. So we have that story. The other story that's well known is that uh, Daniel, there's this uh, thing that's created a big statue. They need to pray to it. They're not going to pray to it. So then they get thrown into a fiery furnace. Um, so we know that story. And um, but and while they're in there, they don't get burned up. Um, there's a lot of hay that's made around that story. So I'll let you read and think about that one. Um, then we have the movement from Nebuchadnezzar to Balsajar. Balsajar. Oh, I can't say it with my mouth. Um, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes crazy and turns into a uh, uh, kind of beast. Uh, the field and he's like eating things but then he turns back to God and he's restored. Balthazar is refuses uh, the son of Nebuchadnezzar the next king uh, refuses to do that and uh, in doing so then this hand comes in 
And everybody wants to know what is the hand mean? Um, the hand is uh, is there, and it says many many tekel and parson. So essentially, what many many tekel and parson? It would be written in Aramaic, and Aramaic is all, is not pointed. What pointed means is uh, it's just the consonants. Uh, so when you're reading through, you would read just the consonants, and much like how our brains can put in vowels. When you understand the context of the word, the same would happen, and not only Aramaic, but Hebrew does the same thing typically. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it lines straight up, so it's just a line of consonants, right? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the, not separate words, right? So the king gets confused, but Daniel, of course, knows how to interpret dreams. Anybody ever heard of somebody who interprets dreams in the Bible? Um, Joseph, you've had this, you know, these things types of. Yeah, so we have things that like this happen, and he says these are, uh, what is it? You have been weighed on the scales and been found wanting. That's what they, well, many, many tekel and parson, many, many and tekel are all just um, weights. So it'd kind of be like saying penny, penny, and dime. Not that they're equivalent, but like, Using uh, measure ounce, ounce, and pound, right, essentially. Um, and um, so Daniel's interpreting this, and then parson is a plural for parsa, parsi, which is, means Persian. <laughs> so uh, you have been found uh, not matching up to this, the Persians, and they're going to kill you. That's kind of what that means. Creepy story because you got this floating hand that's writing on a wall, but it's Daniel. Um, then we have the story of Daniel being thrown into a lion's den. That one happens. You know, ultimately, all of these stories are about uh, Daniel or Daniel's friends standing firm in their faith or using a different way of being. And they're using models around what their faith, how their faith leads them, right? This is important. What is our, how does our faith inform our action? Do we use our faith to inform our actions? Maybe it's a better question in this day and age, as Mary pointed out, right? How then, as we read through the book of Daniel, are you making decisions based off of what you believe? or the stories, or how God has acted in this world and in our lives. Do we know of God's grace and also give God's grace um, in, in our family members, in our uh, community members? Um, do, we, uh, do we operate in a way that, uh, that the way that God is in this world, uh, looking at the outcast and the lowly, do we try to, to model some of that? and how we move and have our being and use our gifts? Or do we center ourselves on ourselves or just appeasing the forces and the masses or the big powerful one, right? And Daniel ultimately, the whole book of Daniel just continues to show example after example of Daniel being a beacon of faith and continuing to live and through doing so, even when you think things are not gonna go well, things turn out to go just fine for that, right? And um, I think that's, you know, part of the hope in the midst of, in the midst of an exile. Um, don't give up all that you are or have, right? Don't assimilate with the culture uh, while you're in Babylon because you will be free and you will need to know these things and act on these things. And even being in this world, it's okay to, to say, no, I don't do that. And it's okay to be in that um, place. Um, God will see you through it, even when it doesn't feel right at the beginning, even when you're cast in a furnace or giant teeth of a lion are in there. I think that's what Daniel's all about. So it's, it's a book that helps to make us think more deeply about kind of how our faith interacts with our daily life. Even though we're not in exile, I wouldn't say we're in exile. 
we're kind of the majority still in the United States. You could argue that secularism is, but maybe it is, maybe it's not. So uh, chapter 19, then we're into Ezra and Nehemiah, um, and, uh, and we will see all of these. So they get sent off. Cyrus says, go build that temple. Later on, they'll say, don't you remember, Cyrus? Like, building the temple was a bad idea. It made everything go wrong for these people. You need to go read your history books. One of those people will say to me. I think that's funny. <laughs> ah, dear king, check back in your logs. Make sure that this is the right move or whatever. However he says it, right? So they all go. And not only does Cyrus let them go, but he sends them along with all sorts of things. Horses, and mules, and camels. And some of their treasure. And some of their treasure that had been brought out of the, you know, uh, all these sorts of things. And Zerubbabel, which is a name not used. Not many people name their kids Zerubbabel anymore. It's not, it's not, not meant what? Zerubbabel? So Zerubbabel would have been in the line of the kings. And then the high priest was Joshua. The, the high priest was Joshua, not Joshua from the book of Joshua, obviously. That's way back. Um, but the name of the high priest would have been Joshua. Zerubbabel. Yeah, Zerubbabel. Um, so, real quick, it, on page, uh, I don't know, first page, I don't know, it says, then the heads of Judah and Benjamin. Is Benjamin's Israel? Tribes. Is that is that all? No, yeah. no, Benjamin is the size of southern tribe. Benjamin is looped into uh, Judah. Okay, so, so Judah is the northern tribe and Benjamin is the Judah and Benjamin. So it's both. I, I would just want to. Yeah. I can get lost. So if you look in here, uh, when you're in the study Bible, if you ever have this chance, right? You'll notice that 12 tribes, Benjamin is like Jericho, north of Jerusalem. It's got a little slot. It's got great land, primo land, because it's Jericho and uh, um, yeah, really nice area. And then south of that is uh, Judah. And Simeon's all the way at the bottom. Now, the, con the, the historians have said that Simeon just gets blended with Jeru Judah. So then we don't hear anything more about Simeon. And then the rest of the tribes are all northern tribes. Now everybody becomes part of the uh, exile and they're just exiled to other places, except for those who are left behind. That's what Ezra and Nehemiah takes up. There are cousins that got left behind. And are they true or are they not? So Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, no gets brought up a lot around mixed marriages, right? So if you were alive in the 50s or 60s, around the concept of whether or not people who are white should, uh, or of any color, should marry outside of, you know, they should marry somebody black or somebody who is Indian, marry somebody who is black, or, you know, however that goes, mixed marriages. Uh, they, they focused strongly in on Ezra and Nehemiah. Because Ezra and Nehemiah talks about that, like, don't do that, right? And uh, that will be more like the chapter head, but you should know that that's part of the history of Ezra and Nehemiah as we enter into it. It's been used in a negator, negative derogatory way, right? Because some people aren't as good as others. It's how they determine life. Because they come to build the temple too. Hey, we've hung out here, we, you know. But what they did was they co-mingled. So they're not pure anymore. They're not Jews anymore because they're not from Judah, right? That's important too to know. Like the Hebrews are not Jews. Sometimes we get a little confused here uh, when we're talking about Hebrews, Israelites. Jews are from Judah, right? And now have been lumped into all of it right, in terms of Israel, but they come from the tribe of Judah, and it's a way that the language uh, moves now uh, for people, um, and uh, the tribe of J 
Judah is the one that is pure. They're taken to Babylon. So it'd be good if you uh, had the chance because the story does a terrible job of this because it splits it. So you start with Ezra and Nehemiah and it's okay. You can read 19 and 21 or should go together. What, they put Esther in the middle of it because Esther happens in the middle of it. But the reality is like you should probably be reading Ezra and Nehemiah and it might be beneficial if you have the time to just actually read it in the scripture. Because it, it, even though like Haggai and Zechariah get put into them and other prophets get put in, and they're appropriate because they exist within these, this period of time, it gets confusing because you don't know when one book starts and one book stops. So 19 and 21 go together? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was interested that Esther's name was Hadassah. Hadassah. Esther? Yeah. I didn't know that. And I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. No, Next I week. I read it here. I Next week, we'll talk about Esther. So there's Xerxes and Artaxerxes that will come in to play a role in the uh, Persian Empire, right? Um, and. Uh, what is this section? Before we leave, there's one section I wanted to highlight. That was in this one. Ah, it's all the way to the end. Last chapter, last page. Uh, uh, page 273. 273. And then I got to close this out because I got to go. All right. So. Last uh, below there, the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of the house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, mm -hmm. 200 rams, 400 male lambs as a sin offering uh, for Israel, 12 male goats, and uh, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they were installed, the priests, and divisions. And the Levites and uh, their groups in the service of God at Jerusalem, according to the, what was written, the book of Moses. Here we have the people are now doing what they did before. They are offering offerings at the temple. That's the point of restoration, right? That's the point when. They have then now gotten to, to a spot where the temple is in such order that they've, they've manned it, right? They've built the building, but now they're manning it, and now they're offering up sacrifices again. And that uh, becomes, it's a simple thing, but it's the reality of when you see that happening, now we, we have switched because um, they have made, they have made the temple. Um, and then they'll move forward from the making the temple whole. This is where the section of Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel kind of ends, and Ezra and Nehemiah now come in, and that's chapter 21. Okay. All right. Great stuff. I think we uh, talked about a lot, so... Hopefully, we didn't get too lost as we we're navigating between two chapters. And you didn't miss our video. Uh, we just didn't have time for them today. So uh, we'll so go back. Next week is 20. 20. Okay. Then 21. We'll keep going. Just we, 20 and not 21. Yeah, no, just 20. We missed, missed a chapter. And so we, had, we just combined the two. Reality is we probably should have done just Daniel this week and then skipped and done just Esther and then brought 19 and 21 together because they're, they're better fit together. As Ezra and Nehemiah would have been easier to cover together. But that's what it is. All right. Esther, did, did Rachel 